We'd start with is just with you guys introducing yourself and the organizations that you uh, work for. Um, so let's start with you, Dan. Yeah, sure. Hi, both of you. Um, I'm uh, Dan Guinness from Beyond Equality, um, which is an organization that's been set up to bring men and boys into sorts of conversations that they're not having, but that they can really benefit from um, and that there, you know, people around them can benefit from too. So we talk a lot about issues like gender equality, violence, sexual violence prevention, mental health, well-being, and also just like how are they connecting with their friends, their mates, their peers, their teammates, their classmates, their colleagues at work, all this sort of stuff in ways that can be more healthy for them and, and better for the people around them. Perfect. And what about you, Graham? Um, my name is Graham Goulden. I'm a retired police officer. Um, I spent 30 years in policing in Scotland and the last eight, nine years of my career, I was a chief inspector working with the violence reduction unit up here in Scotland. And it was in those last years that I started to develop a passion to engage not only boys and men in the prevention of violence, but the bystander in many ways. So looking at boys, men, other individuals as that person who sees things and has that potential to make a difference, the, the potential to you know, do something small that can make a massive difference. So I retired from policing five years ago now, and um, I've taken this leadership bystander conversation through my sort of own organization, Cultivating Minds. I just love what, like what Dan was talking about, creating conversations, you know, within workplaces, universities, schools, sports teams. Um, I also work with the police in the US doing active bystander training. You know, often male dominated cultures where I actually think people are crying out for these types of conversations. So, you know, I think if you ask me what I do now, bystander leadership trainer with a focus on preventing abuse and violence in society. I think that's, that's what I usually say with these conversations where they are, they're not the cheeriest of subjects, but they're the most important. I said, I, so part one of this topic that I'm doing was with Rachel Horman Brown, who is a solicitor and head of domestic violence and forced marriage department at Ramsbottom Solicitors. Um, and that's why I said at the end, at the end of the uh, conversation that these sorts of open non-judgmental conversations are the key to at least getting towards some form of solution that we're, we're never going to find the solution in a conversation, but we're also not going to find a uh, solution without that sort of conversation between men and men, between men and women, um, and also what you're doing down with um, younger boys. Um, so Dan, I suppose my question is what, how do you run these workshops with young boys? What sort of topics do you tackle? Um, and what's, what do you find comes out of, what's the most surprising thing you find that comes out of these conversations? You said this word in there, non-judgmental, or maybe that's two words, I'm not even sure, but anyway. Like, in some ways, I think that's really the core of what we try to do. Now, what we're finding in society at the moment is it's such a polarized type of place. When you're having these topics about men, you're having discussions about sexual violence. And the polarization is not really at the level of like we've done the thinking, we've done the listening, we've checked in and tuned into what other people are experiencing. It, it sort of sits before that and it gets in the way of that really genuine, honest conversation. And what it means is that when young people in particular, but also older men as well, when they come into our spaces, they often have come in with the preconception that it's going to be one of judgment. You know, they're like, oh, hold on, I'm turning up to this space and I'm going to get told that um, all men are trash, I'm trash too, um, I'm a perpetrator of all these horrendous things that happen in society and my role for the next time, for the next you know, hour, two hours together is to keep my head down or, you know, to put up a wall and really defend myself. And so for us, what do we do? We start by bringing those walls down and we start by getting people to put their heads up, you know, open up their hearts a little bit and actually start to share with each other. So we do a lot of games. We do a lot of like interactive exercises. We do a lot of things where you just get um, one man sharing with another man or one boy sharing with another boy, something really, really simple. And so they get that experience of like, Okay, I'm just telling them about the sorts of the sorts of ways that I was raised when I was a boy by my parents or by my friends or whatever it was. 
and just that little bit of sharing will let them show it will show them like i'm not getting judged in this space actually i'm getting value for bringing my experience in and it's an exercise then of like listening to the experiences of other people and then we as an organization will build upon that that sort of foundation of trust that foundation of being a little bit emotionally vulnerable with each other and then we'll try to bring in experiences that they haven't had the perspectives that they don't get or that when they do hear them they tune them out as that's just the girls making that up you know that's just what you know that's just exaggerated that's just what's getting used to attack us and we'll be able to bring them in and say okay we've got that space of empathy let's give empathy to this one as well what does it actually mean um, and then, you know, the conversation depends a lot on whether we're working with like senior execs um, or if we're working with 16 year olds. Um, but from there, you can do a lot of work where you get to the surface, the types of expectations and pressures that people are feeling. The way that they feel like they have to fit in with some norms. And then get them to actually examine like, where does that come from and where does it lead to? And from there, that's where change can happen. And the change happens mostly after our workshops as they start to put stuff together as a group um, and as individuals. I don't know, Greg, but maybe that was like a bit like surface level abstract, but I feel that was the, a good yeah. flow that gives an understanding of the type of journey that people go on in our workshops and that can take them into topics about violence prevention or about mental health you know, or about leadership. And go in lots of different directions but those steps tend to be pretty much very similar graham do you find similarities there with the way you run workshops or is there differences there very similar in some respects you know my my my, my brand cultivating minds you know i'm a real believer in creating conversation you know my job isn't to lecture boys men or individuals on on topics my job is, you know, I, I really hold that view that on the big issues out there, we actually agree with more than we think on these issues. You know, that, that quote Joe Cox mentioned years ago before she was murdered, we have more in common than which divides us. And that's the same for boys and men that, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of boys, a lot of men are deeply troubled with the way they're being socialized by, by society, these mandates of masculinity that, that are imposed on boys. And they're really troubled with that because in many ways, they've been forced to go against who they actually are. You know, and I think that, you know, we have a lot of great, you know, I've worked in prisons before and you, know, you might think you know, this is surprising, but I've met some wonderful young men in, in, in a prison setting um, who, because of the situations they found themselves in, you know, you know got involved in, in, in bad acts and, 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 and commit crime and they find themselves in prison. Um, so they, they, these conversations that, that, that Dan's having, that I'm having allow men to overcome that destructive influence of what they think their friends think you know alan berkowitz in the us the social scientist talks about you know men wrongly often wrongly misperceive you know that they wrongly perceive what their friends think you know for example around sexual violence sex you know, sexism men in peer groups often think that their friends support misogyny or support sex issues the reality is they don't they don't so that gives us a perfect storm for the some boys and men that hold these views not to be challenged and for the good for good people out there to do nothing to walk away from situations and i think when you when you create the conversations um and you allow the sharing of, of views and and um opinions and attitudes you you it's such a reassuring moment for, for boys and men where they actually think you know it's not just me that sees the problem other people see the problem and we also know these types of conversations. You know, we, in this world, we have actively toxic people who need to be challenged, accountable, so on. We know, we know that. But we also have passively toxic people who don't realise what they're doing is harmful. And when you create this, and this is why I like the bystander conversation, because what happens in these conversations is you remove that victim-perpetrator discussion, right? And you put that the young person, the young boy, the young man, into the role as the friend, as the classmate, as the teammate, the work colleague, whatever. And... Um, it's non-judgmental because you, you're, you're looking at them as the solution, but you're also forcing self-reflection. Yeah, you know, I, I use a phrase, hiding the broccoli. <laughs> when I'm doing, you know, if, I, if I'm doing leadership classes with students, I, you know, I don't, you know, there's this tendency to have compulsory consent classes. And I, I'm not a fan of compulsory consent classes, 
because that suggests that all the work we've done in schools just hasn't worked. You know, I think, you know, and I, I frame these conversations as leadership conversations, but I will talk about consent within them and I'll test their knowledge. And what comes out is often very good, you know, knowledge around, around consent. We still have issues which we need to talk about, but I think these, these conversations that I run, that Dan runs and other people run, they really build the team and they overcome, I think the psychology is, it's, it's called pluralistic ignorance, where my views are often this, I see the problem, but I'm not sure what my friends think. I misperceive what they think. And we see that a lot in, you know, a male dominated cultures like policing, military, sports teams, where men often conform to behaviors that they're not happy with. So these conversations are really, really fertile and you're right. And I remember meeting Tony Porter from a call to men many years ago in the US. And I said, what's the best way to engage boys and men? He said, meet them where they're at. And that's what you do, isn't it, Dan, in these conversations, you meet them where they're at. Absolutely. I mean, it sounds it sounds like you've got um, so many tools that you bring in there. And I love the phrase, the hide the broccoli. Uh, it's, a, it's a good one. Hide the distasteful conversation. Yeah, yeah, just hide yeah, the, exactly. you know, because we need to talk about men's violence. And that's the distasteful conversation. So hide it, but within a more productive leadership conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The, what we found um, resonates absolutely with what you've been saying there. We, did, we used to do this thing where you'd get people to come into the room and just ask them, like, what's your views on this topic? Like a little little survey, you know, it takes them one minute while we're waiting for the slow ones to turn up. And then what's your views and on exactly the same questions, what do you think the rest of your group's gonna answer? And almost without exception, there were a couple of exceptions, but almost without exception, for years that we did this, every single person answers that their views and their attitudes are slightly better than their group, right? And, you know, you say that to them and they're like, yeah, but, you know, I, I hear this joke. And then someone else will be like, yeah, but you made that joke. <laughs> You're the person who says that sort of stuff. And they're like, oh, but I'm just trying to fit in. I'm just trying to, you know, like we have to do that sort of... And you can just sort of give them that moment of recognising the way in which this idea has been ricocheting around without anyone actually wanting it, but it's been seeping into what they do and it's been seeping into how people act. It's been seeping into how people in those moments where they're not thinking about or oh, what's going to happen here in those moments which are a little bit more high pressure a little bit more i don't know there's more emotions or they're drunk or whatever it might be what happens what's there what's in the back of their head in that moment and unfortunately if you're not picking up on those little ideas and challenging them there some of those ideas that have been ricocheting around could be the ones that come to the front and they'll be like I can get away with this. This is just what we do. You know, I can I can hit this guy here, or I can push this a little bit a little bit further with this woman that I'm with tonight. And those are the things that they might be unfortunately drawing upon. So this work, however you can get there, this work of actually getting to see that, recognize it, own what they want to be. And I mean, I love that leadership framing as well, because it's it's ultimately what you're asking of them. It's like, yeah, choose, choose who you want to be and, and really take yeah. that and, and go forward and do it as an individual and do it as a group. And it's, yeah, um, yeah for the, the feedback we get is like, hey, that's the first time I've had an honest conversation with this team, with these people, and we've been together for years and it felt fantastic. You know, I loved it. They actually respected me and they listened and all these things that we're told men can't do, we did really easily. We're only together yeah. for, an, you know, two hours and look at it, it all came out. So I think that's, it's just so fruitful and such a wonderful conversation that Graham's having and lots of other, you mentioned Tony Porter, he's, we've, we've um, copied or utilised or whatever you say, yeah. a lot of, a lot of the approach to the call to men as well. Can I just, I'm just going to ask a question here about, um, so there will be people that have a view about the conversation we're having. I thought that with talking about domestic violence against women and talking about gender and stuff like that. Originally, this was the only podcast I was going to do on this topic. And then I had the idea of speaking with um, a female and, and male to, to balance that kind of out. That's like kind of journalist to me, try to make things very partial <laughs> balanced. Um, but there will, be, there will be people that just view this conversation we're having, three men talking about domestic violence against women. They will, there will be people that say, why are you having that conversation and why 
is that okay for three men to have that conversation? Um, and there will be people that think, why are we, why should we be helping men? Should, surely we should be helping women. What would you, what would you guys say, say to those people? I, yeah, go for it, Dan, go for it. <laughs> sure. I don't, in a way, I think we're having a slightly different conversation than if we were, um, if there were women in the room. And what they're saying, what they'll bring is like tremendously important. And I think one of the, the crucial things that we do in our organization is actually, in a way, just get men to take that first little step so they can be open to hearing the things that have already been said. Um, so I think, I think often what we do is just get men past like that little baby step to get past that barrier, that defensiveness, that thing that they've been talking to each other, they've somehow internalized, which is all those things that women are saying on these tricky, uncomfortable conversations are an attack on me. And I, so I think a contribution for us is get people past that step. And the other thing is often what we're talking about is actually our experiences as men and how, where have they come from and where do they lead to? Now, we need to listen to women and take their, their guidance on what the effects of those are. And certainly women can actually, and well, my experience has been, it's been the women in my life who've called out my crap the most. I don't know if I can say that, but you've called me out for, for, for really doing harmful things or for just mindlessly going, going along with what I've, what I've internalized. And so that's crucial that we're listening there, but we can have conversations as men as well. And in fact, we need to, you know, if it was our brothers and our dads who were, who were calling us out and, and it might, it might have a slightly different weight to it. And it would mean that all the weight of the conversation wouldn't have to get carried by the people who are getting harmed by it. Yeah, I, I agree, Dan. I think it's, you know, why, would, why wouldn't we be having these conversations as men? You know, we know that, yeah, let, let's start. We know that men are victims of, of women's violence. We know that, that's, that's without, without we, we cannot ignore that. But we also know that men are victims of men's violence as well. You know, predominantly when we talk about violence in society, men are victims of men's violence. Um, and when we look at domestic abuse, we can't ignore the, the disparity between the, 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 the information that we get. Yeah, we know men are victims of women's violence, but predominantly, I know in Scotland, 81%, 82% of domestic abuse cases involve boys and men as the harm doers, the perpetrators, and girls and women as the victims of these issues. So we need to have a conversation. And also, you know, men's violence against women and girls is affecting men. Um, you know, I've got two daughters, who adult daughters, who I know have been victims of some men's violence at some stage in their life. And why wouldn't we be having these conversations? And empathy for me as someone who works with bystanders, empathy is a key driver for, for motivating people to be more active. And if that starts from your circle of friends, the people you care about, that's okay. It gets you in the room and it allows you to um, move, to, you know, to look at everybody as a potential victim and, and to speak up. You know, and if, if we don't have men speaking up on these issues, and we don't see more men speaking up in these issues, then other boys and men who are deeply troubled with what they see will not have the role models to, to look at that can actually drive their intervention, their, you know, their, it can actually motivate them to do things. So for me, you know, we need to invite men into these conversations. And these types of groups are really, really important because as, as Dan said at the start, we often point fingers at men. We focus on the bad stuff that's going on in society. Yeah, we need to maintain a focus on some of the some of that stuff, all of that stuff actually, but we need to balance it out with the good things that we know men and boys are involved in. And the psychology says that we need to we need to move from just looking at the bad to looking at a, a blend, the good things that men are doing out there. Um, and even this conversation will promote and permit other other men to talk about these issues as well. So the more men that speak up, um, we 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 give we we, we, we give the tools, we give the permission for other men to speak up. Yeah, I think this is, this is what I said, something similar in the previous podcast. I said that th this should be, given that men are predominantly the perpetrators, it really should be up to men to um, solve the problem. And I think what we, we've seen in the media, I saw this with the Sarah, Sarah Everard case, is that a lot of people were saying that women shouldn't walk home in the dark themselves or they shouldn't wear short skirts or something like that. And that is putting the blame on the victim 
and we're not discussing solutions to the problem. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That, yeah. 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 Go for, absolutely. I think, you know, Post said it, this, this last year has been a reachable and teachable moment for boys and men. And thankfully, a lot of men are coming forward, leaning into this issue. We're, I'm, I'm, see, I'm seeing more stamina from men. It's a bit like, you know, we're seeing more people, white people with more issues, you know, more stamina around Black Lives Matters and, and we still have issues, but people are leaning into this. And I think men are really leaning into this issue. And one thing, you know, I, I helped Police Scotland develop the Don't Be That Guy campaign, which looked at, you know, making the connection between words and language and other forms of violence. You know, sexual violence starts long before you think it does. And I was, I was speaking this morning with an ad company and we're looking at doing a That Guy too following on and we're going to we're going to start to look at you know bringing ordinary guys into the room to talk about their healthy views on these issues again following the evidence um which you know how do we create that that norm within male culture that we don't support sexist views we don't support this stuff we want to be doing more here's things we are doing here's things we can be doing because that's the culture i want for my grandchildren for, for, for you know for your kids in the future that that's what i want out there and i think it's really important that we, we we work to do that so dan yeah i think that's how i, that's how I feel yeah and I, I i like that sequence that you've got there in the the videos and um and it's a, a difficult one to get past um at first but you know there is that moment of actual like recognition that there's some harm getting yeah. done that needs to happen you know yeah. and um you know we can't sort of paper over that and pretend but uh, yeah, and then getting to that point of like, okay, this is going on and we can solve it, right? And you can solve it. And like so often the message that I'll bring in is uh, the problems aren't other people's problems. You know, they're not, sometimes we create these stories like all of this violence is being perpetrated by people who don't really look like me, don't really yeah. come from my neighborhood, don't really have my life history and life story. It's been done by the other and that, by the way, it tends to be a dumping ground for all sorts of racist and horrible other views. Um, yeah. But the reality is that a lot of the violence that is occurring is occurring in every community, you know, in different ways and different different forms, but it's occurring in every single community. And often it's within the relationships that exist, right? It's within friendships, yeah. it's within um, existing romantic relationships. And, and that in some sense comes across as a little bit of a, a heavy, reality check for some people but on the other side it's very empowering because it actually means this isn't some abstract thing that you know we need to look to politicians to to address this is a you and me question it's a you and me problem it's a sort of thing that if i'm checking with my mates you know if i take as graham's you know, emphasizing if i take that bystander role hey okay probably my mate you know today isn't going to do something horrible but you know, that yeah. could be the conversation that really, really has an impact and starts to address some stuff and make a change and, you know, prevent some of these things. We'll never know, but it could have been the thing that makes a huge difference to her yeah. in that world of prevention. I think it's important as well. You, you, you can't be part of the solution until you acknowledge that you're part of the problem. Mm. And I think that that is something we do within, within this work. I'm sure, we, we, Daniel, it's helping men have that light bulb moment that they realize like that guy those first five seconds is where all boys men who have been you know we have told jokes yeah. we've laughed at jokes we've, we've used language and banter and thankfully most of us don't get past the five the first you know the next five you know 10 20 30 40 seconds to do what happened in that film but that that film wanted to look at this continuum of abuse you know sexual violence starts long before you think it does force that self-reflection but then the next phase now is to help men do things we i know that men out there and maybe you see this as well dan that a lot of men want to do things but they don't know what to say they don't know we need to give them the words the the, the confidence because it you know this this takes one person to step outside the norm of, of of the behavior to actually totally shift the norm totally shift the norm in the group and other people will follow you know positive evolution starts with small acts and it can be one person saying hey that isn't right you know and it doesn't have to be done there and then it could be done at a quiet moment where you speak to your friend and you say hey mate you know i really care about you but that wasn't right what you did and you know, I, and this is the time when i talk about my wife as a social worker and she's got a lovely phrase called connect before correct 
Hmm. And I use that in, in an intervention sort of sense where, hey, I'm your friend, the connection. Then you go into the correction. You know, one of, one of the first peer intervention campaigns in the United States in the 1980s was friends don't let friends drive drunk. Hmm. And it led to 70% of American citizens taking keys off their friends. And I think that's where campaigns need to be going now, peer groups. You know, friends don't let friends sexually harass. Friends don't let friends carry knives. Friends don't let friends struggle with their mental health. You know, this, it's all connected. You know, mental health, you know, men's violence against men, men's violence against women and girls, and men's violence against themselves. That's self-directed violence. It's often Michael Kaufman in the U in Canada talks about the, 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 the sort of, um, pyramid of violence. It's all connected. Um, and so, again, going, you know, if we talk about these issues as men, we're not only supporting girls and women, but we're improving our own relationships with our friends. We're being more authentic and more honest with each other. And we're likely then to have conversations about how bad we're feeling, how low we're feeling, if we can encourage these conversations. So, yeah, so much we can be doing. And what I love about it is you're emphasizing those small changes there, um, which in some ways maybe feels like the soft option, but I would say it's the smart it's option, the difficult option for a lot of men, because where we prefer to be is, yeah. you know, the superhero in the cape who steps in and smashes some guy with a, you know, in the, when he's like about to commit some horrendous act, right? But we're not, we're not going to be that guy. And sometimes when we try to be that savior, we end up doing things that are, are harmful or actually exacerbate the situation. Um, whereas if you're making those small changes in your relationships, yeah. in your friendship groups, if you're bringing down those barriers, you know, you start to unpack yeah. all of those things that, that, you know, frame this masculinity that people are getting socialized into. And that will have that, that run on effect in the future. Yeah, it's just, it's like as well, you know, we have police senior leaders in policing just now, you know, you know, asking for a call out culture in policing. You know, you know what, a call out culture is confrontational. And as men don't like confrontation, I like a call in culture. A calling in culture is I, you know, I'm, I'm caring for my colleagues. I, I don't want my colleague to lose their job. You know, if I see them doing something, I want to tell them as soon as possible. So it doesn't become the front page of the news in six weeks time. And that's why we do the training in the US police is we, 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 you know, active bystandership is the art and science of reducing harm in our communities, harms to organizations, harms to individuals. So, you know, I'm not being a good colleague if I don't look out for you, you know, and, and that's what we, we how, how we can motivate people to intervene in lots of different situations. Um, yeah, I think, you know, if we're doing anything with boys and men, we also need to create these conversations, but activate them. Give them the skills, the narrative to be able to say things to their mates. I care about you. I don't want you to lose your job, but that was wrong what you did. And that is not only helping your friend, but it's helping you be your authentic selves. It's, it's giving them that identity that they can do that. Yeah. And they're not going to be shunned for transgressing those norms. You know, shunned for not being like that because they realize, oh, hold on. I'm actually yeah. being a good mate here. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. looking after this guy. Yeah. It's a positive thing. Yeah, because I think in, intervention, challenging your friend is actually seen as a transgression against the norm, isn't it? Right. Yeah, and it actually, absolutely. and that's it. And it's so hurtful, you know, and, you know, and it's, it's hurting yourself, it's hurting your friend. And we need to make it a norm where it's not so much challenge, it's support. You know, I'm looking out for you by telling you this. I'm not challenging you. I'm not shaming you. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm quite sure if you guys, if, if you made a mistake and I'm your friend, you would like me to come up to you in a one-to-one, non-judgmental way and tell you what's going on. You know, as soon as I, st I start to shame you, then who's benefiting from that shaming? For me, the evidence says it's me that's benefiting because I'm getting right. that saviour element you talked about there, Dan. You yeah. know, the only person that benefits from my shame for me is the person delivering it. If we want to change behaviour, we don't shame, we call in. We call in, we connect before correct. We do it as a friend. You know, good friends look out for each other, even in the, and that goes back to leadership. Leadership is about not just the easy times, it's about the tough times as well. And this is a tough time. What I'm seeing here is in the, in the conversation we're having, the, a theme is emerging that I'm, that I'm seeing is that it's all solution focused. It's not, yeah. not blaming. And it's, I'm going to try and stick with this into like a topic I wanted to cover, which was what leads 
young boys and young men to go towards domestic violence, violence in general, um, sexist behavior, sexist comments. Um, and I think for me, my background's in philosophy as well as journalism. And so one topic that I covered a lot of was free will. And so I don't, I don't believe we have any free will whatsoever. I think everyone like is the subject of um, outside sources and um, they're the, their culture has an effect, society has an effect, their upbringing, their class, their race, their gender, all of that has more of an effect than we tend to act like it does. Um, so I think all of that has more of an impact than what we perceive as free will. And um, so that also leads me towards reform within the punishment system. So I don't think that um, the way we incarcerate criminals is um, moral. I think that we, I think one of the previous guests I had was a philosopher called Greg Caruso, whose model is the quarantine model. So he believes we should um, contain criminals, but not actively punish them. So it's similar to if, if I went to another country and contracted Ebola or COVID, for example, we would we would quarantine me because that's for the good and safety of the public. Um, but we would not actively punish me because I had no control over contracting that. So I realize I went on a bit of a tangent, but do you guys have any any thoughts about that, about what leads men towards these unhealthy habits, behaviors and stuff like that? Go for it, Dan. You go first this time. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a big topic. I know, <laughs> exactly. So, to make a that one. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? We're, we're into um, ethics here. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I mean, I think this... I feel that the, the approach of thinking about or questioning um, or realising the limits of our free will is really important in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Simply in that it, like, pinpoints what are some of these influences that come in right now i'm gonna i'm gonna leave the philosophical element to a side because i i i do believe i do believe in in essence if you if we're in a position where we can actually imagine our own free will and i don't know if this is Descartes or something here but um th that we're we can actually for the sake of our own like um feeling of control and our own experience of the world also essentially have free will and i i put this in because i i feel sometimes the very deterministic type of uh, um, approach to things while it shows us like hey let's be really 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 observant about the ways in which boys are getting socialized to feel like violence is a wonderful solution to most things um to feel like they're entitled to women's bodies and that they're a failure if they're not actually sleeping with a lot of women, you know, even if they don't want to be, you know, if, if, if they're gay and they're attracted to men, they still should somehow be showing that they can get into that space and, and be attracting women. And, you know, a lot of people feeling like they're failures or they're just pushing things to limit and seem like it's a game. So all of that's really important. And at the same time, if we're getting the sort of work that work and space that Graham and I are doing and they're in, we want to be empowering people to really feel like they don't need to go along with those, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's one thing. And the other thing is that often when you get into the deterministic type of things, it's where conversations will come in where people are like, oh, hold on a second, um, hormones, you know, boys and have got these hormones and they bubble up and it just becomes this uncontrollable thing. And um, evolution, you know, we've, we've evolved that um, men, uh, well, typically there's there's sexual strategies that differ between straight men and straight women that mean that men are trying to be putting themselves out there more and need to be more forceful. And I think it is really important that we say, if there are those elements of evolved or biological or social pressures that are actually putting people go, to go in a certain direction, we also know we also know that most people don't go in those most horrible of directions and actually have actions that are far better, far more positive. And we do also know that whether it's at that evolved psychology or biological level, nothing, it's not a blueprint that our lives are lived out, you know, on the basis of our DNA or on what our ancestors did. 
these are things that actually manifest in the social context that we're in, right? And there's that that key step that's often forgotten in these conversations. And I have a lot of a lot of young men in particular who've become quite enamored with some proponents of uh, evolutionary psychology, and they'll be like, "Oh, but we've evolved to think in these ways, and so we have to think in those ways." And actually, if you look at the the source discussions like the foundations of that discipline it says we evolve dispositions which in certain environmental conditions mean that we can have these tendencies to behave like there's a lot of language in there which says this is not a um everyone behaves this way all the time this is a what's the context and how do you respond to that context you know and you're going to be influenced by what's going on and i think so that also was a much bigger tangent than what you took, Gregor. But it's just to point out, let's recognize what these forces are that, that people are living among and how influential that can be. But let's also give them that feeling of agency and recognize that they can do stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to step aside before I jump with the, the justice and, and all yeah. of those sorts of points. I think, you know, for me, you know, one thing I learned about violence, working with the violence reduction unit is that, you know, violence is, they often say, you know, two, two components, a lack of empathy, followed up by social triggers, right? And, um, you know, and, you know, I often get asked about testosterone, you know, is that causing violence? And that, you know, you know, you know testosterone is a bit like a zombie, it just never goes away. The conversation just never it keeps coming back, it keeps coming back. You know, I, I don't believe in that. I think, you know, I think um, the way we're socialized, the way we're nurtured can affect our biology. We know that from early years yeah. trauma. We know that yeah. if we're living in violent, violent um, networks, support networks, family networks, that can impact our neural pathways and can lead to lack of empathy. So that is clear. And, and also recent, recent research suggests that we know that young girls um, mature earlier than boys. So if you're, we know that young men are living in toxic stressful situations with the longer because the brain is more susceptible and weaker um and that can have an impact um so but yeah i really believe the way you know you know the way that we are socializing our boys it's, it's almost like it's in the air we breathe you know we we hear that phrase toxic masculinity i'm not a fan of the phrase why because i get tons of people off especially men off it's an academic phrase i understand it and I, I often use a phrase by, used by my friend, Don McPherson, who's an ex-pro US footballer. Um, and he wrote a lovely book called You Throw Like a Girl. And he uses the phrase, the mandates of masculinity, the expectations placed on you by your peers, by your families, by your, by your communities, society or whatever. So I think really, you know, we, we, need to, we need to look at the way that we're bringing up our boys. And our, our men in these environments where violence is far too often the default. If you look at young men in prison, you know, and I think 95% of our prison population are boys and men. Again, why is that? Why is that so high within boys and men? If you look at, you know, the I'm quite sure a lot of the men in prison, if you look at their biography, you know, of, of, you know since they were like one, four, four or five, and their, their life biography, violence will be part of that. You know, witnessing it in the home, being, you know, being exposed to it in the community, experiencing it at the hands of parents, you know, in their community, wherever. So it's violence is peppered. And I think that's often throughout their whole life cycle. Um, and is it any wonder we see that outcome at the end? And I think going back to what you talked about, Gregor, about the justice system, I do believe in punishment because I think it's important that victims, we have swift, visible justice. We need, but punishment should be a punishment, but also rehabilitation. Right. I remember I remember going to a, a talk many years ago, with Teddy Waite, who was the, the minister who was kidnapped in Beirut all those years ago. And he talked about that. We don't punishment is punishment in the UK and around the world. We don't focus enough on rehabilitation. Um, we still have people going to prison because it's the safest place for them. That just shocks me. You know, I really disgust me that that's the safe place for a person is, is, is back in prison. Um, so I, I really believe, you know, I'd love people to be sentenced to jobs. You know, you, you will be given a job <laughs> as part of your punishment. You know, if, how do we give hope to the hopeless and the, the people who just lack that, that sense that things are going to get better uh, out there? I'm a great believer in second chances, third chances, even fourth chances. Um, but accountability is really, really important. We need people to be holding themselves accountable and victims need to be 
they, they need to have justice. Society needs to have that. Um, but I'd like to see more, more community-based interventions than prison. Prison is there for the few, not for the many. We seem to have lost that. You know, prison, prison doesn't work for me. Um, and it just, the criminal justice system was designed to solve issues. It creates many more problems than it's designed to solve. Homelessness, addictions, families being split up, no, 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 no employment. Yeah, major issues. And that just ripples out into families, into communities as well. And into particular communities, right? Like it's, yeah. you know, the, this is very concentrated um, among yeah. groups that are already marginalized, right? And don't yeah. have, I, there's, um, I, I thought you were just wonderful there, Graeme. Um, and to throw a few things in, it's been really wonderful for our, our organization over the past couple of months. We've been watching, um, this documentary and I'm terrible with names. You're very good at you're very good at utilizing and bringing in uh, evidence, Graham. I've been impressed so far. Um, but it's called uh, it's called the Feminist on Cell Block Y, um, and it just it actually looks at this group um, in a U.S. prison who got together as a group of men and actually used one of Bell Hooks' books. Um, Bell mm. Hooks is this really incredible. Uh, what was um, she's recently passed away, but really incredible thinker about masculinities and also how they intersect with other identities and um, you know, general social um, justice and social issues. And they used her book, The Will to Change, and go through it and actually like, hold on a second, what is that violent history that, that Graham was talking about, how that has impacted on me? And what is, what is actually the consequences of my actions now and the people around me, on my kids, on my family? And those... That, that film is really wonderful. Bill Hook's work is really wonderful. And I think it captures so much of what Graham was just talking about. Um, yeah. yeah, so this, you know, I, I, try and, I try and read, you mentioned me talking about evidence. I just, you know, I, I spent the last years in policing using an, a public health evidence-based approach to tackling violence. You know, yeah. you, don't, it's, you, you don't deal with Ebola or COVID by just trying things out and then trying something else out. You Or that, something else out. You try something, if it works, you keep doing it. That's yeah. that's the evidence. And, you know, if I was an academic just now, there's, there's so much research being getting done on, on these types of subjects. There's not a lot applying, you know, being applied for it, you know, being applied in the, on the operational side of things. And um, I just think, you know, it's not about becoming an expert on that research or that research. You know, you know the work of Alan Berkowitz has really influenced my thinking around, you know, the good in, the, in society um you know working with the likes of Jackson Katz over the last few years and Tony Porter again has really made me think about this need to look at men rather than just neutralize the issue you know a lot of people want to neutralize sort of gender neutralize the issue of violence why would you do that when the evidence says we need to be focusing on that sorry sorry for jumping the go I, I you know it's so important it's, it's important both because it's actually allowing us to understand what these influences are on men you know like you can't talk about what's driving them you know you can't Greg you can't talk about you know what's determining or what's influencing their behaviors if you don't talk about their gender and you don't talk about how they're raised as boys and how they treated the other boys around them and also you don't understand the different sorts of violence if you don't understand the power dynamics between people and if you and this in our workshops with young people is often a huge point for them huge point where they'll be thinking about hold on a second, you, we're having this conversation about what happens in, in bars or nightclubs or student life. And, you know, if, if that thing that, that, that we've heard that happens to girls, if that happened to me, I'd like it. You know, I'd feel great. Like, oh yeah, my butt got touched. That's never happened to me. That sounds wonderful. And then you're like, oh, hold on a second. What about if we give you this context of, you know, you, you're, in this, you're in this space where there are, maybe dozens of people who that night are also doing that same thing to you where you're worried about leaving the place and how you're going to get home safely if you know for a fact that you your you and your peers or people around you are likely to experience this type of violence which you know this little incident is a part of it's a it's a gateway to it and if you're worried about what's the reaction of this guy going to be if i if i tell him i'm uncomfortable you know, because you know that a lot of men feel entitled to get angry, to get aggressive. And so if you can bring in that little bit of, hey, there's a bit of a power difference here. There's a bit of a, a context difference here. 
it's an important lesson for people to understand that their own experience of the world around them is not always the best tool to understand how other people might be experiencing it. You know, it's, it's an important one, but it's not the only one. And sometimes it doesn't actually do the job. So you've got to be listening as well and you know, using empathy there. I think what you're saying there, Dan, about um, well, what, what women go through when they're on, say, nights out and out for drinks and stuff like that. This, I had an experience that maybe a couple of months ago that, that showed me the, the, the scale of the problem. I was walking home about one o'clock in the morning on a fairly busy street, pouring the rain. I had a big black jacket on, hood up, walking myself. And a girl came up to me and said, do you mind if I walk with you just up to this busy street? I want to walk. There's a, a bunch of guys by me. I'd want to walk with them. And of course, like I walked her to the, to the street, to the bus stop, made sure she was, she was fine there. But as I was walking home, I thought the choice she had to make was whether to walk herself in front of a group of men or go up to this complete stranger with his hood up, who she had no idea about like what my intentions were, and kind of gamble. And that kind of that to me showed the extent to what women go through every, like every, every night out. It's a pretty yeah. vivid story there. <laughs> It, it totally is. And, you know, it's amazing to hear that, you know, there's obviously something that she sees in you to give you the confidence. And, you know, I remember just after Sarah Everard case, a friend of mine who's a survivor of sexual violence, you know, she said to me, we've just had, we've, we've just added another, another thing not to do on our list on nights out. And I said, what is that? Don't get arrested by the police. You know, and it was really powerful when she said that, you know, that was, you know, in, in reference to, the, the police the met police officer who who, who murdered Sarah um and you know I I learned from the likes of Jackson Katz that that type of activity where you know, you you get the, the 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 flip chart paper on you ask the men and the boys what do you do to avoid being sexually assaulted the nights out and you might get a flippant comment you know don't get arrested and sent to prison <laughs> the stereotype of going to prison and being you know but when you ask girls and women it's incredible you know and it made me think and it it, it, but it really upsets me that i don't know upsets the wrong word it yeah it it, it it annoys me that all men are being judged on the actions of the few but that's never going to change until the the majority of us speak up you know it's not all men but just enough of us to muck it up for the rest of us you know as we need to these are ways to motivate men to be speaking up you know we are being judged by the actions of the few and guys that's going to continue until we speak up right and we shouldn't be yeah and we should we should continue to be made to feel uncomfortable because you know what we deserve that because we are not challenging our friends that's how i see it now um but yeah it's 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 sad that people we care about are ordering their lives daily to stop themselves being sexually assaulted that there's um seeing those foot charts it's worth jumping online oh. to see the jackson cut chart the jackson cat flip charts and actually what comes out of these workshops because it's it's profound you know there is dozens on one side and one maybe one on the other yeah um so check it out but and i graham i loved what i see is like a a positive twist or the way that not all men should have been used it wasn't and rather than being like, oh, the issue here is that people are talking about men's behavior and what that is. Yeah. And the problem is the people who have experienced all this horrible stuff and who are afraid and who are calling for justice, and many of whom have kept this to themselves for years or decades. So maybe the problem's not there. Maybe the problem is that you know, men aren't actually getting out there and saying, stop the violence. Right. Let's prevent this. Let's be active in that space. And I, it could have been. I mean, if someone was going to, it's hard. I know you don't. It's not normally how we react when we get defensive. But when we can actually create space for people to realise that that feeling that bubbled up, where they're like, oh, "Hold on, I'm being unfairly attacked here," is actually let's unpack that a little bit and see. Well, what's the real source of that injustice in this conversation? Mm -hmm. And it's the violence, right? And it's that power disparity and it's who it impacts it's like let's jump into that space and be active in addressing that problem so we don't have to talk about not all men because there's no violence right that's the that's the end point 
and that's that's the thing that all men can have a part in playing you know part in actually i don't know producing in their friendship groups in the communities that they're in yeah no i i totally agree i think it's there's, there's so much potential and, and so much strength in this type of work um and we need to we need to work hard as, as men on this and we still need to accept the criticism we still need to accept that and not and use that discomfort to move a lot of men get uncomfortable and they fight back we see that a lot with men's rights activists men's rights groups who will just use their every breath to blame women for all the issues and they don't actually realize that they're actually creating so many more problems i i often call some of the some of these groups you know men's you know uh, wolves and sheep's clothing they promise so much for boys and men but they don't deliver anything you know i remember listening to a podcast many years ago of three guys speaking about um helping men and they spent 35 minutes of a 40 minute podcast decrying feminism there was no solutions absolutely no solutions given um and it was just i think in just you know and i think our young men i don't know how you find this dan but i see lots of narrative from the manosphere from men's rights groups and so coming into schools coming into even into some of the headlines in the papers some of the stuff around angela arena in the last few days if you look at the headlines it's manosphere talk it's it's men's rights type type narrative that's coming in minimizing the situation pushing the blame back to the victim um and i i really think yeah, our young boys are really susceptible to some of this stuff, really at risk. And the work that Dan does, other people do, that I do, I suppose, is giving some resilience to these young men. You know, if we can give resilience for them to, you know, to, to, uh, you know, to, to counter this stuff, the better, the skills to be good men in, in 2022. And that's, that's awareness and, and confidence. And it, you so I do see that coming into our, our workshops in, yeah, yeah. you know, all sorts of age groups and so often driven by like an easy answer you know it's what's wrong why why are you frustrated and they're really genuine feelings of frustrations of no i feel like we're not getting heard you know and as a 15 year old boy not many people are listening to you and uh if if there's then this conversation about um violence against women and girls and then that that's felt like we're giving voice to the girls. And, but me as a 15 year old, I'm not being heard in that conversation. Yeah. And that's, that's a genuine frustration. And then, um, I mean, again, it's not recognized in the bigger picture, but it's a genuine frustration that they're feeling and they've got all sorts of issues going on in their life. Or, as most of us did when we were that age. And then you hook into the easy answer being the problem is those girls the problem is your classmates are talking too much that they're getting the, the attention there's this thing called feminism which i don't know how it happened like this but has been recast as being it's about attacking men and yeah. you you know there's as with anything there's a there's a few there are like there's a few people who call themselves feminists that do do that but if you look at the absolute core of it i mean mm -hmm. the, the all the people we've been mentioning tonight have nothing but love for men and i suspect that everyone we've mentioned would call themselves a feminist or or would say that they're profoundly influenced by feminists yeah you know? so there is actually this like pr problem that that feminism has that means that it's such an easy like uh, what do you call it like a it's a a straw man i don't know if that's equitable language but probably not not too much of an issue but you know it's a straw man for these for the frustrations that vulnerable marginalized men and boys feel um where they can be like oh the problem it's that times are changing and you're not getting what you're due um yeah rather than saying you know what are the issues actually going on here and if if you're not getting what you're due is it really the already marginalized women who are taking that from you yeah or is there maybe other things going on and then yeah. quite often you'll get you'll get some very sort of upper class middle class people um speaking about issues that are not really affecting them um and uh but they blame on they blame on women or they blame on changing times or whatever else um yeah. anyway that's yeah. that's my feel on yeah that. well I, th I think i think many many men still think like this and it's mm. and, and what they're really angry about is the fact that they're being held accountable for what they do or what they say and yeah, and, 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 that, and, they, and they just don't 
you know that and they don't they don't like that that discomfort you know and i remember when when jackson asked me that question as a man what are you doing to prevent violence you know 2009 2010 when i, when I first met jackson i felt really uncomfortable for a few seconds but then I started to think about my own experiences. You know, I lost my dad to suicide, as I, as I said that, in 2008. I, mm -hmm. I thought about my daughters, and I thought, he's right. You know, as a police officer, I dealt with incidents every single day, nine times out of ten, boys and men were the victims and the perpetrators of violence. And he made me really think, wow, this is the, you know, why haven't I seen this? I'm quite embarrassed that it took me into my 40s to see all this stuff. <laughs> You know, he made me see things that had been invisible for the vast majority of my life. My privilege as a, as, a, as, a, as a man, white, heterosexual male, the privilege I have in society is incredible. And, you know, we need to make the invisible visible. Michael Kaufman talked to me about making the invisible visible. How do we make and how do you know, we need to help? We need to make men feel a little bit uncomfortable, but not too much that they fight back, which we often see. But discomfort's good. Discomfort can be can be good. It can be cleansing and anger you might then have you can use that not to be, you know do the typical man thing and fight this stuff or be the be the hero as you talked about there but to subtly talk about it you know you know we you know for me if you're passionate about this subject which you are dan and lots of people are but if you talk about it you become the, the natural go-to in your friendship group for other people who think about this stuff as well so i often say to people you know, going back to leadership, working in organizations, if you feel strongly about mental health, domestic abuse, sexual violence, bullying, or whatever, talk about it. Because and you know, because when you then become the ally for people in your office who are struggling with issues like that, um, and yeah, and I think you can build the team by you know what you what you promote, you permit, and you, we can take that in so many different routes as well. So yeah, it's been a great chat. Yeah, I just want to um, wrap up. I want to be like sympathetic to both of your times. I know you're both um, very busy. Um, and so what, one of the things we have touched on already is just masculinity. And I just one just a, like, quick question is just, do you think there is a crisis of masculinity? Do you think there's such a thing as toxic masculinity? Or, or is there, is all masculinity toxic? Or is it just certain types of behaviors? That's another Big, big question. I'll, I'll, I'll go first to this one, Dan. You can go first to this one. Go for it. You know, do I think, I don't think mask in itself, masculinity is toxic. I think, you know, I, I, that's why I use that phrase, mandates of masculinity. I think the expectations are the, the part of the problem. And yeah, clearly the acts that we see from some men are the, are the problem. Do we have a, a crisis of masculinity? I think it's, I think, I think we have men who are, who are deeply confused and grappling with what they're seeing. For me, that's the crisis. That's the bit where we, how do we help men overcome these, con, this confusion, the, the I think the trauma that men are feeling, you know, men are deeply uncomfortable with what they're seeing and the happening to the friends. That's, that's, that's bringing in moral injury, moral trauma, because they're not doing anything about it. And I think for me, we can over, help them overcome that by giving them the tools, giving them the skills to be able to, to address these issues, to repair that trauma, to make them feel that they can do things. So, you know, I, I don't like when people say there's a war on men. I, I don't think there's a war on men. You know, I think that's just too easy. That's 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 the men's rights groups just not confronting the issues that are at play. Um, but you know, I think we do need to help our boys and men better. We need to make it better for our boys and men, not not just for them, but for everybody in society as well. Because that, if we make it for if we make it better for boys and men, we can make it better for everybody in some respects. You know, and you know, in society. So that's that's my tuppence worth there. More than tuppence, I think. But uh, <laughs> um, what grounds left? I think we covered toxic masculinity before, uh, and I agree with what um, Graham said. You know, analytically, I can see the purpose in trying to address how there's these ideas that then lead to harm in all sorts of different parts of people's lives. But as a tool to bring people on board, um, we found that it, it alienates more people um, and has already, you know, sadly already been captured by uh well by men's rights um groups or people who are kind of anti-feminist as like aha see this is what it is yeah you know this concept means that they're saying that all men as humans are bad rather than saying oh no 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 which i would point out what that term means is there's 
there's these ideas, there's these gender norms, there's these mandates, there's these man boxes that people are getting put into that are really harmful for them and really harmful for society. And, you know, we see that happening in lots of ways. And I think for me, one of the big things that we emphasize is that masculinity is uh, definitionally what we imagine men as being and how they're behaving. And that changes and it's different in different communities. And it's extremely varied in the UK alone, let alone if you go around the world. There never, there never was a traditional masculinity. Um, that's that's a myth that never never existed as a solid thing that was somehow like homogenous in any society, let alone more broadly than that. And any times there have been moves to crystallize something and make it very clear, basically all it does is hurt and harms and causes um, all sorts of damage psychologically to people who don't fit into those those things that have been arbitrarily plucked out of the air. Um, so my, my kind of way to navigate all of this is be like, there's this plurality there. And there's also a capacity for you to actually take ownership of that and for us to take ownership of that. So let's, you don't need to be ashamed of your interests. That's not, that's not what we're going to, you know, that's not the direction it's, we can embrace those, but just really actually be accountable for it. You know, lean into some of those words like responsibility but do it in ways that are empathetic, do it in ways that, that care about how you're impacting upon the people around you. Um, and I think that's a wonderful place to be really positive um, and to be really caring about each other as men um, and also about all the people around us, regardless of their gender. Yeah, totally agree. Um, yeah, I mean, what I usually wrap up these um, conversations with a question of um, how, how are you how are you optimistic? But I think the conversation we've just had, that's what we've, that's our main theme is that everything we've been talking about has been very optimistic, being very forward looking um, and solution focused. So I suppose last question, where can people follow you? Where can people stay up to date with what you're doing? And where can people find the organizations that you're both with? Um, okay, I'll go first. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I, use, I use Twitter a lot. I'm a bit of a Twitter addict. And just why? Because I think it's a great platform to share views and evidence again we talked about there so my it's just at graham underscore golden um my website is just grahamgolden.com um i didn't go any i didn't make it any other other name i just called it that because that's who i am um and yeah that's that that's where you can find myself fantastic um you'd find me via the organization and we're we're on we got a lot on instagram we're also on twitter a little bit on linkedin um and a little bit on facebook and it's always with beyond equality it tends to be beyond underscore equality at whatever that translates across that for those different um, platforms and the website's also there um yeah, and, and please do reach out if you want to get us in to run a workshop um also we've got volunteering uh programs which start with like a a one day self-reflection and discussion and it's a really fantastic space for men to enter into with other men uh, from across the country and sometimes around the world and just talk about how are these issues impacting upon us? What are those questions about power, privilege that Graham brought up and how are we getting impacted in our mental health and our relationships and our work life, mm -hmm. all those sorts of things. So do come and join, do follow. So anyone watching or listening, anything anything we've mentioned throughout the episode, it'll all be linked in the show notes. So you could just go there to find all this. But guys, thank you very much for taking the time. It was a great conversation. It's very open, very not judgmental and yeah, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you, Gregor. Thanks, guys.